Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achinth. I have the pleasure of actually sitting with Mr. Abhiji Chavra, who's a well-known figure in terms of geopolitics and uh, with his very, very popular channel, although which I also have a very close in- inkling to. Namaskar, welcome to the show. And let's hope to talk geopolitics and the rise of Bharat today. Namaskar, thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. So where do you see Bharat standing from the last conversation we had? I think it was just about when the you, the, the, the Israel war had started. Um, you know, the world was trying to kind of figure its shape out and see how the world will go and stuff like that. Where do you see Bharat and the geopolitical environment, as a matter of fact, just as an overview of the world? And then let's pick up on subjects that I've kind of thought of. Yeah, um, great question to begin with. I mean, the world is changing very rapidly. Geopolitical realignment has been happening this this uh, decade. It's going to happen more and more. The speed may pick up. We are seeing conflicts uh, erupting in uh, various parts of the world. The U- Ukraine conflict has been going on for quite some time now. It's going to be the two-year anniversary very soon. We also have this new conflict, which is like the dormant volcano has blown up again, which is the Middle East, the Gaza thing, Israel, Gaza, Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, all that. And there are other flashpoints also in the world. So, yeah, it's it's a tense situation overall. Uh, the global economy is also kind of in the doldrums. More economies are going into recession. Japan is one, a few others as well. Germany has already gone into recession and so on. So there's a lot happening in the world. Overall, if you look at where India is, India is the only economy that has no chance of going into a recession. That's a plus point. And India is one of the nations that has options today. The U.S. has set its own path. I mean, they have been determining the fate of the world since the unipolar moment in the in in the 1990s, early 1990s, and they have been, you know, essentially running the show. Then you had the brief emergence of China when uh, it threatened to be the, the 21st century threatened to be the Chinese century. Well, that's not quite the case anymore. The Chinese century is not going to happen. China is facing an impending demographic disaster. The economy is not doing that great anymore. So it's not going to be the Chinese century. Now they're talking about an Asian century. Well, which Hmm. other nation in Asia do we have that could contribute to an Asian century? Well, I can see only one essentially, which is India. Unless you consider Russia also to be part of Asia, which it most mainly is actually. It's a Eurasian power. But apart from China and India, we don't have any major Asian powers as such. Japan used to be a great economic power, not so much anymore since the Plaza Accords of the 1980s, which kind of deflated the balloon in a very slow way. And then we we have other nations like Iran and Turkey, which is like straddling the, the, the Bosphorus, both sides of the imaginary Europe-Asia divide. So we don't have any other great powers that we can think of. So... Uh, Overall, India is, Bharat is a nation that has options right now. We are kind of a bridging East and West. We are on good terms with the US and the West. We can talk to them. We have cordial relations. We can, we can, we are dealing with them in a, in a variety of ways, economy, defense, and so on, so forth. We're dealing with France in, in a very strategic way, of course, uh, which is kind of distinct from the way we are dealing with the US. And we also have excellent relations with a nation like Russia, with all the uh, global South nations, with the Eastern Asian nations, with the exception of China, of course. We are part of the Quad, we are are part of BRICS, we are are part of the G21, we brought the African Union into it, and so on. So we are now playing a very major role. Uh, Militarily also, we are now expanding, we are now demonstrating the kind of footprint we have in the Indian Ocean region, our uh, warships are patrolling the the way, you know the the Western Arabian Sea near the Strait of uh, Bab al Mandeb, uh, the and so on. So we have that happening. We are apprehending pirates. We also have capabilities eastwards and so on. So now the world is beginning to see a more uh, visible India. We always had hmm. this capacity the past five years or so past 10 years also, we've had this capacity, but we haven't really exercised that. We haven't really demonstrated that. So this government uh, is now more confident. It is it is now willing to demonstrate the capabilities that we have in, uh, in a benevolent manner, in a non-threatening manner. I don't think any of the Eastern, I, I don't think any of the Gulf nations feel threatened by India's presence over there oh. and so on. So overall, it's, it's, a, it's a good time for India, but it's, it's still a dangerous time overall for the world and for india it's it's kind of we're in a situation of of, of walking the tightrope act between east and west uh, we have the ever-present threat of china 
uh, uh, the, the Bharat-Tibet border. We also have the US that doesn't really want to see Bharat rise too much, obviously. They've mm-hmm. already made a certain mistake in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, 80s with China. They midwifed the rise of China. Uh, uh, they aided and abetted the rise of China and they don't want to do the same with Bharat. So we are kind of you know, doing this tightrope balancing act. We need another 20 years of peace and then Bharat will be unstoppable. So that's how I see our situation vis-a-vis the global scenario right now. Interesting. And that's something that I think you've continued from last time as well. You said that we need about 10, 20 years to settle down and we need to have no wars by that time. Uh, when we when we let's let's start with the neighborhood when we look at that it's 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 not a very pleasant scenario we've got afghanistan which was doing well suddenly there are funny things that are happening in that area as well uh yesterday we also said we saw stanikzai who's uh you know in the in the in the home affairs sort of a game foreign affairs he says that we don't recognize the duran Rain. that doesn't mean anything we don't recognize even the pakistani passport that's that's a match in a fire You've got the Iran-Pakistan situation. You've got the Chinese not very happy with the Pakistanis. Uh, you've got China itself. And you've got an explosive situation which is, uh, you know, in Myanmar and a little, I call it Chota Pakistan in Maldives. So there is a, there's, there's a lot which is happening within the neighborhood itself. How do you kind of gauge uh, our, let me lightly say it because Mr. Jayashankar says it and that's one word I picked up from him, game. In, in uh, of geopolitics in the neighborhood itself. Yeah, it's it's an interesting analogy. Game. I I, I sometimes liken geopolitics to a sport in which the objective is world domination game. and there are no rules. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Game most of the time. <laughs> so we have been uh, blessed by the gods with this wonderful neighborhood, these wonderful neighbors that we have. Yeah. We have the Maldives. We have uh, our estranged cousins in Pakistan. We have our other cousins in Afghanistan. We have other other cousins, Bangladesh, Nepal, that China is trying to woo, Sri Lanka. And of course, we have our slightly more distant cousins in, in Burma, in Myanmar. And all these places have their own problems. So we have, yeah, like you mentioned, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Well, Afghanistan, Pakistan, that's a major border dispute. The Pashtuns, the Afghans, the Taliban, whoever it is, they do not recognize the Duran line. Uh, the, the Taliban are Pashtun nationalists, after all. I mean, they are a strongly nationalistic organization. They now run the, the Emirate of Afghanistan. They have reasonably good ties with India. Not bad at all. No overt or covert hostility that we can detect. And there are allegations that the Taliban receive a stipend of $50 million a week from the United 60. States. 60. 60. Uh, 60 is it? Okay. okay. The, the number may, may vary a little bit, but we, we hear these stories from, from with, credible uh, sources. From performance, also performance incentives. <laughs> performance incentives as well. So there you have it. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting scenario there. So, it, you know... Pakistan, we know why it was created. It was created to counterbalance India. It was created to serve the the British geopolitical interests in this region, in the Indian subcontinent, and also in in, in West Asia, in in the Gulf region. So that's why Pakistan was created with that long-term objective. Now, obviously, the UK ceased to be a first-class global power in 1956, let's say, the Suez Crisis. And uh, that's Mm. when the Americans put their foot down and the French and the British were relegated to second class status. Now the British are actually a third class global power, not even a global power, not even a regional power, actually. The only thing that they have is the world's largest uh, money laundering uh, operation, which runs out of London. So that's all they have. So now Pakistan is a US proxy and it's, it's it serves a great amount of utility to counterbalance India, to keep on needling India, to keep on offsetting India. Uh, so 1970s, 80s, 90s, even the 2000s, 2010s to a certain extent, the Pakistanis bled India with their terrorism, which was funded and financed by the US. We all know that there is no controversy about that. Now, there is this other nation, Afghanistan, which is like, yeah, part of the Indian subcontinent, that seems to have been placed right now, the Taliban has, seems to have been placed and put in power with the objective to counterbalance Pakistan. So Pakistan counterbalances India, uh, Bharat, and Afghanistan counterbalances Pakistan because of this open border, which they don't recognize, the Durand line, which they don't, they, don't, they don't recognize. So Pakistan have their hands full with the Afghans. You can't threaten a non-nuclear armed nation with nukes. You can't do that. There's no point. And there are no big population centers that you can obliterate as such, apart from one or two. So most of the Afghan population is scattered out there in the vastness of Afghanistan, which is a reasonably large nation. 
So you can't threaten them with nukes. Nukes, there's no point. Then what do you do? You're gonna you wanna invade them. You're gonna the Pakistanis have a certain amount of armed force. It is, I would say, overall on balance, it's greater greater than that of Iran. But there's no point invading Afghanistan because it's going to ca- cause chaos in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and other parts of, of, of Pakistan where you have si- si- sizable Pashtun populations. So it's it's a problem. It's an intractable problem for, for Pakistan. Um, be, some people, you know, when 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 the, the Taliban took over, there was this belief that it would give Pakistan strategic death because the Taliban are essentially run by the ISI. Well, that has, that has been put to rest. The Taliban are by no means controlled by the ISI. If they are controlled by anybody, they're could be some element of the U.S. involvement there. So that's a big problem for Pakistan. And the, the, the border is constantly hot. There's always some skirmishing happening, some, uh, you know, some small arms fire or whatever, some cross-border activity happening. And the Pakistanis, I mean, how many people can they keep at the border? So it, it's, it's a big problem for them. And of course, we also have the Pakistan-Iran issue, which happened recently, which flared up very fast and also died out very fast. So yeah, that happened... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, some people have speculated it was a it was a fixed match of sorts to take out. Uh, you know, yeah, that's. The, I mean, some people have. There's obviously obviously no means to substantiate or corroborate that uh, that speculation. But yes, we had this issue, and the Pakistanis and, and look, the Iranians don't like Pakistan. The yeah. Afghans don't like Pakistan. India doesn't like Pakistan. Nobody likes Pakistan. As long as the Shah of Iran, Shah uh, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi was in power, Pakistan and Iran, Persia had a reasonably good relationship. In 65, I believe the Pakistanis even, even took out their fighter planes and landed them in Persian airfields uh, so as to safeguard them from Indian airstrikes. So the Persians, uh, the Iranians helped Pakistan in 65. Today, so after 79, everything changed. We have this theocratic government that's come to power, this hardline Sh- Shiite government. And... Uh, Pakistan being a Sunni nation, there's this obvious friction there. And uh, yeah, so uh, so the Iranians don't like Pakistan. They, they see Pakistan as a nuisance, as, as, a, as a pain point. Uh, I, I suspect that some of them at least would, would, would want to go back to the days when there was the India-Iran border than the, rather than the Pakistan-Iran border. So uh, yeah, so the relations between, between Pakistan and Iran aren't great. Balochistan obviously is a problem for both nations because Balochistan, the Balochi people are neither Pakistanis by ethnicity. They don't believe that they are part of Pakistan and they don't see themselves as Persians either. And half of yeah. Balochistan is, is within Pakistan, half is within within Iran. So that's a problem for both nations. And we have Chabahar and Gwadar, both on, on the Makran coast in Balo- Balochistan. That also adds a certain dimension to that. So we have these issues. So Pakistan has these issues. And of course, Pakistan uh, these days isn't in a much in a position to needle India too much because they know that they're going to get a response, a sizable response. So there is that. Then we have the open India-Tibet border, which the the Chinese refuse to demarcate. So that's always an issue. Uh, India, uh, Bharat in the past few years, five, seven years, maybe 10 years, has been, uh, you know, ramping up its uh, infrastructure development efforts along this undemarcated border. If you go out there in Ladakh or wherever, you will see that the BRO, Border Roads Organization, is at work day and night, winter or summer. They are at work all the time. They're building roads in extremely, extraordinarily inhospitable inhospitable terrain. And because of this incredible breakneck speed, relatively speaking, at which we are constructing roads and all infrastructure, the Chinese... Uh, seem they probably became quite un- uncomfortable, and that's why we had these situations like Doklam and and uh, the the clash, the, the the Galwan clash, and so on, and uh, the other clashes that have come out. You know, of, of footage has leaked out on the internet of Indians and uh, Chinese soldiers fighting without kung fu. The Chinese don't know kung fu apparently. Where only in movies they they can use kung fu. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, but now, right now, the, the situation is, uh, I think, a little more stable. We don't quite know exactly what's happening along the undemarcated border, but it seems to be a little more stable right now. Uh, then we have Nepal. Uh, the Chinese have been trying to woo Nepal for quite some time, and there's been some pushback from the population. They want to return to Raj Tantra. They, there is this movement to return to the monarchy, the Hindu monarchy that, that Nepal was, was divested of through a variety of techniques. Uh, and uh, our then government might have had some something to do with that, unfortunately, regrettably. Then we have Sri Lanka, which is going okay right now. It was in a deep crisis for for quite some time. Even now, the economy hasn't quite recovered. But yeah, it's 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 
it's existing right now. I like, that's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Maldives, it's a per- perpetual seesaw thing. The Chinese take over at some times, some points in time. At some point in time, it's it's a pro-India government. So right now you have a, you have a pro-China government there, and uh, yeah, so that's that's uh, an issue for us to resolve. It it eventually uh, one day will be a long-term solution to that problem. Uh, let's see about that. And then we have uh, Bangladesh. The Americans really, really wanted Ooh, Sheikh Hasina to get out of power. Yeah, they 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 invested a lot of their credibility and all that into that, but did not work out. So that is India one, US zero actually when it comes to Bangladesh. <laughs> actually, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. And then we have Myanmar, Burma. So Burma is, if you look at Myanmar, the northern half of Myanmar is essentially in a state of lowlessness, anarchy. Yeah, the three, no one the is three brother alliance. Yes, although th- those those three factions, we have the Arakan army, which is kind of very quiet these days. They are they are Ara- watching no, the show. Yesterday, yesterday, Arakan actually, incidentally, if I may, sorry to interrupt you, issued a yeah. statement saying that your Kaladan multimodal project, as well as the tri hmm. tri national highway, will be safe. Nothing will happen to it. All we right, will not okay. fight. They issued security <laughs> guarantees. Well, 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 well. All right, all right. Okay, it's okay. Getting big, getting just... big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so we have yeah, so we have this extremely problematic situation in yeah. northern Myanmar. The military junta is not currently in control of these regions. We have a certain amount of Chinese involvement in there. The, and, and this entire issue, this entire situation is you know spilling over into India, into Bharat, in the state of Manipur. Manipur has been more than half of the state of Manipur in the past few years has been has been overrun by these uh, Kuki, Chin, Zo, whatever you want to call them, these tribals who have Kuki drifted Zos. across. Kuki Zos, because the because of the free movement, the, the open border situation. So if you look at satellite images of the past 10 years, you can see over the past 5-7 years, a tremendous amount of new villages cropping, cropping up in southern Manipur. It's all these Kuki, jo, Kuki Zo individuals who have, who have come across the border. And the moment they reach, they get uh, documentation and stuff. Many of them are, are apparently coming in through Mizoram as well. The Mizoram government has ref- has, has opposed the, the move of the central government to, to seal the border which is interesting. They don't have the right to do that, but they're doing that and so on. So there's a whole situation over there. Manipur is under siege. The indigenous people, the Maitis, the Hindus, uh, they occupy only 6% of their original territory. That is ridiculous, but that's what's happened right now. So it's a very volatile situation over there as well. Yeah, yeah. And the situation that we are seeing in Manipur has been constructed over a period of at least a century. The British started the process of, of bringing these, these foreigners into, into Manipur's territory. I'll not go into the history, but it's a long process. And the solution is going to take time. It's not going to happen next week, next month or whatever. It's going to take at least 10, 20 years minimum for this to be solved. But uh, hopefully we will have justice for the natives, the Indians and not the foreigners, the, the, the drifters who have come from across the border. So this is a geopolitical matter. I'll tell you what, it, it looks like a tribal war in some remote part of India, which is it is not the case. This is a geopolitical matter. They want whoever is behind this. I mean, imagine these ragged, ragtag, illiterate tribals drifting across borders. Who is organizing them? Who is coordinating everything? Who is representing them on social media? Where is all the money coming from? Where is this inexhaustible supply of arms and ammunition coming from? I mean... Think about it. These are not these people. They don't have half a brain. Most of them, okay, they don't know how to hold a rifle. But suddenly, they're all well trained. How does this happen overnight? Clearly, there is a let's say a larger force behind this. Maybe more than one larger force behind this, larger power behind this. I mean, clearly, uh, the the arms and ammunition are not being shipped uh, being shipped from Thailand or Cambodia or from no. some other nation across the sea. No, 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 no. Somewhere else nearby, probably. I would say it's coming from Yunnan. Yeah, so there is a Chinese really? involvement for sure. Oh yes, and then there is the Baptist conversion angle, which is happening while the the battles are raging. So that Baptist money is coming from where? It's coming from a whole hemisphere away, I would say. So there's a whole lot happening there. So, so ideally, they they want India to erupt into into chaos before the 24 elections. There's the farmer protest, the you know this this astroturfed movement that has erupted suddenly again, like like on demand, on cue, like it happened a couple of years ago, like three four years ago when President Trump visited, and so on. And then you have the situation in Manipur, so they're trying to squeeze India from multiple angles. So that is where we are right now. A very we we don't we don't have the best neighborhood. 
to say that would be a significant understatement. But uh, maybe it's a test that the gods have given us. And if we, if we pass this test, then nobody can stop us. I think that that's that's a very interesting way of putting it at a test. Because, you know, I, uh, if you can deal with these, these many googlies around the place, I guess you can deal with a lot more. Uh, you know, let's let's go to the world. Yesterday was an interesting time in the Munich security dialogue. We had uh, world leaders either calling each other short of punks, where Zelensky, if you saw, was literally, I mean, he's a killer, he's a punk, he's this, he's that. You know how Zelensky is. Okay. That aspect came out with Putin. Of course, everybody was a little pissed off about Lamalni, uh, the Putin's yeah. uh, so-called, uh, you know, second-in-command. Uh, I call him the second in command, of course, because if Putin went, this guy would have sat on sat on the seat. There's just no ways about it. So, anyways, uh, so Navalny went away, uh, and there was a lot of this thing. And then there was an interesting conversation. Uh, although everybody looks at it with Mr. Jay Shankar beating the Jesus out of uh, you know uh, Blinken and uh, Annalena Baerbock, but there's certain things he said in that which were very significant. Uh, mm -hmm. Firstly, he spoke about the BRICS. I want to start there. What is your opinion about the BRICS as a platform itself? There's been a lot of talk about it. New countries have joined in. One country refused to join in, Argentina. How do you foresee the role of BRICS going forward in the world order? Yeah, BRICS is an interesting organization. It was created as, as by someone, I don't remember who, I forget the person's name, but it was an acronym. And then the acronym Brick. took a life of its own. Right? Sorry, Wall Street, uh, Wall Street guy, um, Stephen something. Yeah, yeah. Brick was the acronym. Yeah, the, it was Brick, and then they added the S to the end of it, and somehow it morphed into reality. It became this grouping of of, of five nations, and um, you know, let me give a very stu silly parallel. There is something called SARC, South Asian. Association for Regional Cooperation. And that is now a de facto defunct organization. And the reason for that is that the two largest nations within SARC can't get along, which is India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And it is mm -hmm. India that has essentially killed off the, this, this uh, thing for now. So we don't have any SARC summits. We have nothing, pro no progress on the front. And because India doesn't see any point doing that. So if the two largest and most powerful nations within a multilateral grouping don't get along, that, that thing is dead. Now, if you look at BRICS, then the two largest economies are India and, and China, China and India. Mm -hmm. And they don't get along. <laughs> so the question is, would, can is it is there a possibility that BRICS could also go down the Sark road? That's a question. Now, that depends on, on, on India and China, uh, essentially. And I think India sees BRICS as, as, as an organization that has a significant amount of utility. And, and, and potential. And that's why India is going ahead with this and, and being part of this. And as you can see, the uh, if you look at the BRICS economies, then uh, the economies put together are greater than that of G7 now. You know, the total economic heft is greater than that of G7, of the G7 nations. And now, like you said, uh, an additional five nations joined or four, whichever Argentina refused. But you have yeah. Saudi Arabia, you have uh, the UAE that joined, you have uh, Egypt, you have uh, Ethiopia, and you have Iran. So these nations join. That makes it a much more formidable uh, kind of organization. F apparently, France also wanted to join, but I believe the Russians refused because we do not yeah. want a we do not want an espion, a, a spy in our group, you know. So, uh, but but the thing is, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are also there. I would I would not call them spies, but they have historically been on uh, on the side of the West. So it's interesting to see these nations uh, join as well. Egypt also, as you can, as as we know, it has its own history with the U.S. So it's also part of BRICS now. Um, so BRICS is interesting. So this is where we see India straddle both sides of the divide of the east-west divide, north-south divide, whatever yeah. whatever we want to call it. Uh, so India has been uh, increasingly pushing forth the reality that it's a nation that can bridge both sides we can get we can talk with both sides of the divide and we can be the bridge that binds the two together we can you know be the mediator if required so india uh, obviously plays a major role in brics uh, i believe it was india that uh, kind of scuttled the uh, the prospect of a brics currency actually last year during the yeah. just before or, or or during the south africa summit uh 
that we did so it tells you that india holds a significant significant amount of power almost like a veto power when it comes within brics when it, when it comes to these major decisions so that tells you the kind of uh, power india has within this uh, organization and uh, it also allows india it also affords india a large number of options being part of such a powerful and large economic grouping uh, and yeah it's so that there you are i think it it gives india lots of options it uh, gives india diplomatic heft it gives india more economic heft it gives india leverage when it comes to dealing and negotiating with nations like the us it also gives india bargaining uh, power as opposed to leverage that we can influence these nations why don't you do this for us or that sort of thing so i think overall it's it's great for india it's great for other nations as well uh, we could be witnessing the coalescing of of the global order into two groupings the global south and the global north uh, the global north is obviously the us led coalition of nations which is you know the the european union plus nato plus the five eyes and whatever else they can they can you know take within themselves which also includes most of africa i would say uh and latin america also because that's part of the extended monroe doctrine kind of thing that's happened that's still going on so the us overall controls a significant amount of the global economy and all that but brics could sign over time play a significant role in in bifurcating the world order perhaps and obviously india is one of the founding members in india is one of the major economies the second largest economy so that gives india a lot of uh overall heft and strength and leverage and much more so i think it's it's great that india is part of brics and we should uh try and expand it further every year as long as certain nations don't come within the ambit i mean the chinese would very much love to have pakistan within brics you know brics plus no actually actually last time they called a brics plus meeting that coordination meeting right so mm -hmm. and this is reported india worked with china to keep pakistan mm -hmm. away and china was actually okay. happy to keep pakistan away all right so okay that's interesting this is reported in, in the mainstream <laughs> media i was like okay that's interesting you know right yeah so was... yeah so i mean uh, you know i guess the chinese also know isko dur rakho yaar you know this works just well, well the pakistan is where china's iron brothers for a long time for for close to a decade after the americans lost interest but after the coup against imran khan the chinese the the, Amer the pakistanis are back in america's lap right america's now. lap so yeah, yeah the chinese have good reason to kind of be wary of the pakistanis right now at this mm, point in time interesting 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 i mean see the the the, the deal is that yesterday again he said something which was very interesting to me and i've been kind of hinting at it on my channel for a while mm -hmm. that uh, there are two types of powers in this world one are revisionist powers and one are reformist powers revisionist mm -hmm. revisionist powers means you get off your throne and i go sit there and then i decide what needs to be done and that's what china says and yeah. then there is us who says okay the order has been working mm -hmm. everything is fine there are issues in it like there is in everything else let's sit down talk about it and fix it let's become more inclusive so this is something very interesting to me and where i think mr jay shankar actually pitched the indian narrative across that listen we are not threat to anybody how do you uh, see that aspect as far as uh, i won't say a docile indian narrative but a a domineering what but a very calm and a conscious one yeah yeah absolutely so uh, there are revanchist or revisionist powers like china and there are reformist powers like india so we have been uh, you know we have been very reasonably saying that we need to reform the world order it, the world that we live in today no longer reflects the or the world order the way it was in 1945 at the end of the second world war we cannot have the kind of uh, structure that the united nations still has it's yeah. obsolete it it represents a time capsule from a century ago it it doesn't uh, you know uh, it is not relevant in today's world we need to reform the the uh, security council and so on and so forth we, we have been saying this for a very long time especially since mr modi came to power he has made it a point to say this over and over again and now dr jay shankar has also been doing that for the past 5 years so we have been very calmly very patiently very consistently and very reasonably being saying this being repeating ourselves that we need to reform the way the world is run we need to reform the major 
uh, institutions and organizations like the United Nations to be more inclusive and to reflect the current realities of the world. So what what we are doing is we are playing the long game. We know that just talk is, is not going to do anything. But we are setting the stage for the time when we are actually in a position of much greater power that we can push things through, that we can do it while still sounding reasonable. We can say that we have been saying this for the past 28 years or 32 years. We have been saying it. And now we are pushing it through. But look at the history. Look at the context. We have been saying this and we are just doing what is fair. So what we are doing at this point in time is preparing the groundwork for, for a push that may happen 20 years down the line. That's the way I see it right now. So, so you say Absolutely. something over and over again and you say something that is reasonable and sensible and something that is completely fa factual and you keep doing it for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And that, that what that does is that when you actually are in a position to do it, forcibly, let's say, it still looks reasonable because it is a just thing to do. So I think mm. that's what we are doing right now. Uh, China, that's obviously, they talk... Yeah, so that's how I see it. China obviously has been talking about its peaceful rise, which nobody actually believes in. There's nothing about China is peaceful. Uh, China threatens everybody. China threatens each and every one of its neighbors. They even reopened in ancient border disputes with Russia, the Usuri River thing. The uh, and, and they tried to, uh, you know, rename Sakhalin. They, re they renamed Vladivostok and God knows yeah. what. The Chinese simply cannot sit, just cannot have peace with anyone. They had signed a formal agreement with the Russians in the early 21st century, in the 2000s, and they had closed the border dispute, the Usuri River border dispute, and now they have reopened it. I just don't understand what it is about the CCP that simply will not is not willing to coexist in peace with any of its neighbors. They see a moment of weakness from Russia or whatever, they're going to pounce on that. Yep. At the end of the day, if you make everybody hate you, if you make everybody be scared of you, nobody will mourn when your when your de demise happens. No one's gonna come to your aid. No one's gonna come to your rescue. And I'll 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 assure our Chinese friends or viewers or whoever they are that China is not going uphill right now. China is mm -hmm. headed downhill. You have a disastrous demographic decline coming up. Your TFR has gone down to 1.09, which is a catastrophe by any by any metric, by any measure. Your economy isn't doing great. By 2050, your median age is gonna be what 48? By by 20, by 2100, your, your population is gonna be less than half of what it is today, and your median age will be 68. Imagine a nation where the average person is 68 years old. That's what China is gonna is going towards. And there is no stopping it. There is no stopping China. China is the world's strangest society. You go and meet any Chinese person, that person, he or she, will have no sister, no brother, no aunt, no uncle, no nephew, no niece, no female cousin, no male cousin, nobody. They are a single point at the at the at the very end of an ancient lineage. And you put them on the front line against India. It's going to be a disaster for them because at any point in time, their lineage will end just like that permanently. That's not a nation that's going to fight. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that doesn't instill the fighting spirit. You got seven siblings and you go and fight, you'll say, TK, I'll go and die, but my, my family lineage will continue. That what what gives you the, that courage and that will to fight. The Chinese don't have it. So I would say that I would, I would you know, ask the Chinese, our Chinese friends to reconsider their, their their approach towards the world. I mean, you just can't keep fighting everybody. At the end of the day, something's going to go wrong and no one's going to save you at that point in time. So I don't see a great future, future for China. For India, mm. we have to be careful. Next 20 years, if we rise to a certain level, we're going to be unstoppable. So yeah, revisionist versus, uh, versus uh, reformist Reform. power, very stark difference. I think that's a very interesting. Uh, uh, thank you for that because China, uh, you know, everybody, the narrative is that, oh, you're falling for this narrative that the Chinese are falling, they're putting everybody to fool and all that stuff. But people just don't realize how bad things are. I've actually yeah. made a joke out of it. So Xi Jinping, you know, came and gave a speech and said, don't mm -hmm. think about money, uh, think about the future of China. And he said that to his stockbrokers. He closed his laptop, went back home, had a little hot pot with his wife, went out to sleep, next day morning woke up and the economy went down by $6.3 trillion. And that actually happened, actually. You know, if you look at it, uh, jokes apart, that's what that's that's exactly what happened. The, the economy just tanked. Mm. In one day, that entire stock market market crash was was a disaster. Uh, and their, 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 uh, uh, their whole... Uh, 
solution to that was putting in 286 million uh, billion dollars to it so i was like wow okay i need a bath tub full of water you giving me a glass fair <laughs> enough let's see how, how that yeah. goes forward i mean see but uh, we we've, we've spoken about the scenario now let's come to the point where there are conjoint interests within the world to keep us and you hinted at this as well uh, to keep us in our place we see these uh, narrative attacks at one point we also see foreign handed protests we see what's happening in the northeast so i put all of these guys in a term and we briefly spoke about it last time called the sino wahabi leftist alliance you know it's it's mm-hmm. the three of them kind of sit together pretty easily you can actually put any situation in the world fit these three guys there and you'll find there is an influence um, so how do you look at the factor that there are these powers who are more than willing to work together to ensure that we don't rise to our place and they might be enemical uh, uh, by, between themselves yeah it's the old adage right my enemy's enemy is is my friend that yeah. sort of thing and and you know it's 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 not uncommon for adversaries to work together temporarily to to serve a sh- sh- common shared interests interest i mean if you if you have lots of uh, differences but a few of your interests align you may temporarily for for a certain purpose set those differences aside for a while and work together or work together in in a in a field where where you don't really come come into conflict so uh, yeah you see you sometimes see very strange bedfellows in when from the perspective of ideology from the perspective of geopolitics and for and international relations also so for example when since you talk spoke about sino wahabi leftist right sino wahabi leftist yeah so i mean if you look at the, the us uh, the 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 leftists or the marxists or whatever you want to call it socialists they aligned with the feminists and they essentially co-opted the feminist feminist movement and and turned it into something unrecognizable feminism was really needed in the us it it arose in the in the, in the 19th century for, and it was a very just cause the, the 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 society really needed to emancipate its women the same way it needed needed to emancipate the non white people so that was really needed women were really downtrodden in the us in the 19th century they did not the suffrage came much later universal suffrage they were essentially in, like non citizens or whatever so feminism was was a just cause it was a much needed thing but in the 1950s and 60s it was completely co-opted and hijacked by the leftists and it was turned into something unrecognizable it became this uh, harsh brash outspoken vituperative movement and today if you look at the nations that lead the world in misandry i would say the us could probably rise to the top you know yeah so it, it it's totally it's it's been totally transformed and, and turned into something unrecognizable from what it originally was so you have these these historical uh, uh, examples of of very disparate ideologies coming together and 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 you know and syncretizing into something uh, you know that you could not have imagined so you have the chinese who are uh, as we know very anti islam they have been uh, demolishing mosques in the xinjiang region and turning them into parking lots and worse that's what one hears we hear about what they have been doing to their uh, native uh, the the uighur population of the region and so on uh, so they are very harsh and intolerant when it comes to any any ideology that could potentially possibly chinese uh, sorry challenge the 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 supremacy of the chinese communist party and yet they are willing to work with nations like pakistan and work with various anti india elements in in a variety of ways and 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 uh, and uh, you know fund those those ideologies that they are squashing in their own within their own territory yeah. so uh, <laughs> yeah so it's a, it's it's not surprising for me to see this and the chinese anyway they are kind of well nominally they are left because they are the chinese communist party of on course paper. they on paper mm-hmm. they are left of course they are out and out capitalists when it comes to their economy yeah. and when it comes to the overall the way the thing is structured it's actually an empire china is actually an empire mr xi jinping is currently the emperor the current iteration of the chinese uh, son of heaven you know the chinese this uh, specific uh, dynastic cycle uh so the chinese are nominally only nominally only on paper leftists but they are willing to work with leftists who uh, well 
the we have the the this leftist phenomenon in india and in india the leftists are mercenaries if you look at leftists anywhere in the world whether it is the ussr whether it is historically china or whatever other nation you can think of uh, cuba for example in all these nations the communists or leftists or marxists or whatever you want to call them are out and out nationalists when it comes to india india's leftists are mercenaries and they are typically anti national anti india they are available for hire at a, at a at a reasonable price to anybody who's willing to uh, give them what they need which is typically champagne and limousines and and yeah. business class travel to various conferences in the world and then you know some kind of status that's all they seek and in exchange they will do whatever they they are asked to do so the chinese obviously since they are uh, are are an anti india power they would definitely want to work with with the leftists within india and work with uh, these wahhabi powers or whatever like pakistan and whatever elements we have within india as well they'll certainly mm-hmm. be happy to do that um, historically we know that they have funded the the various insurgencies that erupted in the in, in the far east of india in the northeast of india and in 50s 60s 70s onwards we have seen uh, photographs of various uh, naga separatist leaders uh, at the wall of china in in, yeah. in other parts of china we have seen that now, it's it's on the record yeah it's on the record so they have a long history of doing that and they have also uh, some of their 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 publications have been leaked out in which they they seek to balkanize india that will that will be the ideal situation or ideal outcome for them they've written about this uh, typically we get, we don't get to see this because it's all written in chinese but sometimes it leaks out so yeah that that is known to us so yeah it overall it is not something that surprises me to see these strange bed fellows get together the chinese and the the communists and 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 the islamists or wahhabists or whatever what is what is interesting is that now when it comes to the gulf region the the west asia middle east region there is a clamp the down on all these extra- yeah, yeah the exactly <laughs> Yeah so there is a lot of reformation happening there there's a clamp down on any of these tendencies you are seeing a, a move towards modernity a move towards openness and all that whether it is saudi arabia whether it is other nations as well so it's it's very refreshing to see this happening in the middle east in west asia at the same time we have all these other idea the same ideologies that are quite uh, you know quite quite a challenge in our part of the world so yeah that's where we are yeah i mean uh, th- that's that's a good way of putting it i i before we kind of take start taking some audience questions i wanted to ask you a lot of these things are now saturated situated dependent upon what actually happens in 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 america and certain countries in europe as well you're going into the european union election where if the right does come into place ukraine knows is being thrown into the dustbin and the same is in america as well a lot of these um non required if i may uh, organizations which are playing havoc with the world if you notice what hillary said yesterday in munich is that uh, we are worried about trump and you know here's washing your laundry abroad we are worried yeah. about trump because they'll they'll take us out and this is like you know when we get pissed off and mani shankar ayer goes to pakistan and speaks crap imagine what happens to those americans there it's terrible i mean as a country i would i would as a citizen i would be incensed anyways coming back to uh, the, this thing so how do you see the american deep state kind of uh, have they decided to switch from this deep leftism to a more centrist or i won't say right because people just don't understand what right means uh, i would say a centrist or a center right sort of an approach which we all hope to actually happen uh the way i see it it's not quite the case uh because uh right now uh if you look at the policies of the of the current us regime the biden regime they have essentially thrown the gates open the rio grande border texas border uh millions actually not thousands not hundreds not tens of thousands millions of immigrants are pouring in every year imagine the nation's government is aiding and abetting illegal immigration that is the definition of corruption Yes. That's the definition Chinese. of a corrupt government. Yeah. Yeah. And the Chinese filling yeah. in, you know, doing anything. 
whoever whoever comes in so if you're indian you go to the us you want to immigrate to the us you have to go through this entire painful process of applying for a visa h1b visa whatever it is then you wait 78 years for a green card then you wait 300 years for for a citizenship instead of doing that just go, just burn your passport go across Mex- the mexican border and say that my name is raul and that's it then you can become a us citizen right away you'll be given documentation and whatever you want so that's the situation right now so uh, and, and clearly, it's not Mr. Biden who is running the Biden regime. It's not Miss Harris, Kamala Harris, who's running the Biden regime. Somebody else is running it, but the nation is run, being is being run. So that's what one would refer to as the deep state, the the whatever whatever it is, the, the Pentagon, the the, the foreign esta- establishment, or whatever we want to call yeah. it. Yeah, so they are running it, and they it is their policy to keep to to open up the border to bring in all these millions of undocumented illegal immigrants, give them, uh, you know, the whatever papers you need for for voting in the U.S. You don't need to be a citizen to vote. That's a funny thing. You just need a driver's license. You give them those documents, you can vote. You can even become a cop over there. So and then these people are being are being bussed in or flown into various parts of the country, far-flung parts of the country. They're being settled there. They've been put up in good hotels and, and all that. And they are being integrated into the U.S. society. This is not a re, uh, uh, the, the deep states, uh, you know, leaning towards the center or, or whatever. This is it leaning deep left, hard left. And these people are going to vote in the next election. And I, I think it's going to be very hard for Mr. Trump to become president, I think it's going to be very hard for him. I don't know who the who the other candidate is, is going to be. Most likely, it won't be Mr. Biden. I mean, no. If if they if they go go ahead with Mr. Biden, they're going to lose anyway. So it probably won't be Mr. Biden. It probably won't be Miss Harris either. So I wonder who it will who it will be. Will it be Oprah Winfrey? Will it be Dwayne Johnson? Will it be Michelle, uh, Michelle Obama? Let's see. It'll be some. It'll, it'll probably be somebody at the intersection of multiple things. You have to be black. You need to be uh, trans or or woman. You need to be LGBTQ. And I don't know. They're gonna try and check tick as many of these boxes as possible. But yeah, it's it's gonna be something different, and let's see how it goes. Yeah. So let me put a counter argument, if you don't mind. Uh, one, yeah, these guys are you know doing a whole lot of crap. Sorry, I just got clicked. Uh, a, a lot of crap by, as a matter of fact, as you said, by opening up this border and rushing people inside and stuff like that. One of the things that I kind of uh, look at as as a counterbalance to this leftist ideology is that you have a certain power structure within the US which is coming up, which are these hedge fund guys previously who supported the leftists because it gave them more control. Today they're looking out and saying, yeah, well, this damn thing doesn't make us money. Mm-hmm. You know, and you put, put us into China, look what the Chinese are doing. Now I'm shifting into India and that's what the papers actually said. So how, how, how far do you think these 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 hedge fund guys would be able to kind of push back because I find them as the new deep state, you know, which is kind of, and I keep saying this, the old dirty old deep state, which is the aristocratic kind of very structured, stiff upper lip sort of a thing. And you got this new guys who are saying, listen, you can keep your ideology where the sun don't shine, but buddy, I got to make my money. Your old money is all over. I don't have any more. So either you let us do what we want to do. But that's the only way I see that this whole leftist deep state would get challenged. Uh, your opinion on that? Okay, so uh, the way I see it is different. I mean, let me explain how I see it. Absolutely. I see things from the perspective of power. And what yeah. is power? So I have a very, 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 very simple definition of power. Power is the ability to command and control. That's yep. all. That's power. Can you command and control with money? Can you do that? You may have all the money in the world, but somebody else has all the cops at their disposal and all the army and the, all the hardware at their disposal. Who's going to be in power? So you may have all the money, all the hedge funds in the world, but the ones who command and control the instruments of power, which is the guns, they are the ones who will decide the destiny of nations. Mao Zedong said that political power flows out of, out of the barrel of a gun. Of the gun. At the end of the day, yeah, exactly. At the end of the day, it's about how many people are, are willing to obey you unquest- without question. And instantaneously, and people with guns, that's what matters. So at the end of the day, I don't see these hedge fund people as having, yeah, they, they have money. They can be used to, 
to shape the global economy to influence the the way the global economy uh, evolves but at the end of the day the people who make the decisions and who hold the power are the ones who control the police and the military and and they are the deep state whatever you want to call them that's how i see it very simple so you you're basically saying till the time the defense department doesn't give the middle finger to these guys we are still stuck in that aspect i think you know that's that's the whole thing and i keep on hoping that it's the defense department that will stand up and say enough yaar you know well, let's see <laughs> just stop this because you know you're going to blend us up into trouble um anyways let's let's get into some questions guys uh, it's time for you guys to ask some questions so please like this video subscribe to the channel so that it spreads across all over the place so please 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 like is most critical that's the minimum that all of you need to do by just touching the like button don't hit it don't hurt it just touch it that's all and of course you can contribute towards the dev talks efforts using the qr code or paypal which is there in the description or super stickers or super chats or you can also become a member thanks so much for watching till now and so many comments have come in sanjay ji thank you so much for becoming a member uh aditya thanks so much for your contribution he says what is your opinion on the farmers protest going on in europe <laughs> ahead of the continental elections as europe seems to be turning right not all are happy look um, many of these farmers protests uh, farmer protests in europe actually may be genuine protests because the european governments have been clamping down on the rights of farm on the rights of farmers they have been forcing them to shut down their farms they they've been forcing them to kill off their their cattle and livestock they've been forcing them to go green or whatever whatever it means so many of these protests are genuine but of course there's always the possibility that some of these could be not grassroots protests but astroturfed protests so it depends on the context it depends on the nation in some nations you have genuine protests in some nations you have fake protests that's just the way it is and, and it is all designed to be as chaotic and and incomprehensible as possible sorry. so that nobody can guess what happened sorry about that i some reason my fingers are a little slippery today anyways <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> no but i agree with you as a matter of fact you know the european protests are uh, somebody asked me the other day you know you're you're complaining about your farmers protest why, why why do you support the european ones because i did a whole study and i put out a video on what are the issues that those guys are facing i said you know when you look at them different uh, context different issues come on exactly they, they look at them uh, if you have 100 acres you're supposed to give 5 acres fallow and use 25% of your land uh, 25% of your produce has to be organic where the organic stuff comes from china mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and their supply chain issues there are this that how are you supposed to do this i don't understand and that's when i said you know yeah i do support what what those guys are asking for they exactly. leave us alone man be human beings and on top of that you say 2030 uh what cut off all sorts of uh, carbon using pesticides then you went and sanctioned russia who used to give you the fertilizer and then you <laughs> say mo khana de do bhai kar kya rahe ho yaar i mean so there it was a more valid this thing this is a joke uh, very much valid I mean, yes exactly yeah. shakti man thanks so much sir i disagree that only a handful of sikhs favor Khal khalistan khotestan by the way brainwashing by sgpg pop culture and punjab board books have created a big undercurrent government needs to take it see it and take big deradicalization steps look i am not very conversant with this khalistan issue i i look at global geopolitics i don't look at you know uh, internal politics and what's happening within so i am not sure that i am the right person to ask this question overall obviously i do not agree with this entire khalistan thing and i i as far as i see it i think it's a minority of of people who who want this i think most of it is once again astroturfed it's it's mostly emanating from the five eyes nations mainly canada the us and the uk and australia and some of it in new zealand that's how i see it some of it could be italy also well, well italy also is a vassal state unfortunately of the us vassal so that's how i see it i'm 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 not exactly sure of what's happening within india i don't look at internal politics so i could be wrong about that okay so that's how that's your you spot on spot on as a matter of fact last time i last night i discussed this that all they trying to do 
is you know when we say there's no resonance within india they're just trying to show you there is some resonance within india but the super mm-hmm. fools don't realize resonance by 10000 people in a state with some 30 yeah, 40 million yes. people doesn't make sense so exactly. you know, please so they're just trying to kind of show you on the face guy you know last time you say that there is nothing within india so what are you doing in this and that no 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 there is see 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 there is in your this thing mm-hmm. exactly. but it won't work yeah. it won't work at all because uh, it's it's going to get uh, and i call them khotestanis because you know khota in punjabi is gada so, <laughs> okay it hurts me personally because you know i i am a punjabi so it kind of mm. nicks me in the wrong wrong place uh, mm. thought provocator thank you so much since already uh, have the pm in pok munir could simply de- declare sharif punjab pm bhutto sin pm kukkar balochistan pm and imran khan as jail pm That's declare the everyone the pm it doesn't matter in pakistan who the pm is because the real power lies within with the army and the isi it's a very small number of people who who actually have the power so declare everybody pm it doesn't matter <laughs> but yeah but how do you see the factor that yesterday this this uh, chief commissioner of rawalpindi and no other city apart from rawalpindi come out and says listen i fudged 70000 votes I'm sorry, my conscience doesn't let me. I tried to commit suicide. I can't, but I'm going to come out and say this. This is what I've done. Do what you need to to me. And they arrested him and they threw him in jail and there was a whole protest in this and that. How do you see that? I mean, this is like a conscious building up in the biggest shithole in the world. <laughs> I, I <didn't laughs> no, I wasn't that. aware of this, but I don't know. Somebody so, somehow grew a conscience. <laughs> Suddenly, what, what happened there? <laughs> रावलपिंडी ब्रिलियंट आई मस्ट से I wish we could do stuff like that in India. <laughs> you know, I wish. <laughs> Anyways, next one, Aparna ji, thank you so much. He says, I just wanted to thank you and Abhijit ji for all the work in on encouraging and igniting the spirit of nationalism, pride in our armed forces, and being a Sanatani. Thank you so much. That's very kind comment, Aparna ji. Uh, Pravlam, thank you so much. He says, it seems the deep state is hell bent on not letting Trump fight the next elections. what does that mean for bharat and where does where is ramaswami poised mm, good question uh, ramaswami is a complete newbie at this he has no track record in politics and that's why his entire game was to was to target 2028 and in this this election cycle he is he's hoping trump wins and he gets a cabinet position or hopefully vp that's the uh, ideal outcome for him yeah. so that's how he is poised yeah sorry that's the aim i guess yeah that's it you know yeah that's the aim that's how i see it uh but i i agree that the the deep state or whoever runs the 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 nation of the us they obviously don't want to see trump win again because he's going to again try and upset the apple cart he's an outsider in politics he's a, he's a he's a businessman he's not a politician he's not a career politician uh, as a businessman he has a tremendous amount of contacts but he doesn't have those elite level political contacts and that's why th- that inner circle, circle of politicians the elite level they see him as an outsider outsider as an upstart and they want to put him in his place they did that in 2020 by through whatever happened whatever it was that happened okay his loss apparent loss and um, they would not want him to to win the 24 election either So yeah uh, what does it mean for Bharat it means nothing for Bharat you know whether the democrats win or the republicans win it's the same thing for Bharat same because thing. at the end of the day it's a puppet who's the president okay the us is is a two party system which is just one step above one party state like china or north korea there's no real difference imagine a pakistan that was not a failed state but a successful nation that's the us so at the so the us just like pakistan has has power concentrated in an invisible small number of people and it doesn't matter who wins the election it's it doesn't really change much for bharat i mean in some Uno cosmetic party. things will change here and there sorry uno party uno party yeah so you know it it doesn't really matter for india for for bharat you know some small things here and there may change the president may be more, more friendly or less friendly or whatever but at the end of the day what matters is what happens behind the scenes and that never changes 
I mean, can you imagine they have conservative Democrats and leftist Republicans? I'm like, what? Just shift each other, man. What are you wrong with you people? <laughs> Just merge already. <laughs> merge. At least get your bloody stuff straight. I mean, what's wrong with you people? Colors right, at least, yeah. Yeah, get your colors right. Exactly. I mean, conservative yeah. Democrats. Purple. <laughs> Which way do I look? Left, right? I don't know. It's weird, you know. It's very, very weird. Ram Ram hmm. Abhijit ji, Adi ji, Ram Ram ji, your views on Westminster democracy, unlike Bharat, uh, Ghanatantra and communism, being the sides of the same coin, Western Christianity with democracy being experiment for Islam. Whoa. Uh, the Westminster system is what we follow in Bharat, unfortunately. Yeah. It is a system that evolved over a rough, roughly a period of a thousand years in a small island, okay, the, the, which is England. And it has been transposed on this giant civilizational entity called India. It is not something that's suitable for India. So it is it is something that is, is not going to last a long time in Bharat. Okay, the Westminster system, this parliamentary elections, first past the post, all that. Bharat has its own system and eventually will return to that. It'll take time. Uh, so is the Westminster democracy and communism two sides of the same coin called West Christianity? I'm not sure what that means, so I don't know. Um, it's a little tough on the second part, yeah. Yeah, that that is even... Um, Democracy is experiment for Islam. There is no democracy in Islam. So I don't know if it's an experiment anywhere in Islam. I mean, even if you look at the nations like uh, Saudi Arabia, like the UAE, which are opening up, which are very, very open societies, very respectful social societies, tolerant, tolerant societies, especially the UAE, it, these are not democratic nations. So mm. I cannot think of any actual Islamic nation that is a democracy. Can I think of any? Well, Malaysia has elections, right? Indonesia also has elections. So, well... Yeah, what well, Indonesia is is still very much a nation that's oh, Indonesia is still past. very mature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely correct. Mm. Still very mature. Yes, yeah, yeah. Very much, yeah. But uh, thank you so much, Bakra Ul Thadi Bhes Ul Badi. But I have a little thing to add to what he said. Uh communism. The problem with communism when it kind of so-called died in 1990 was the factor that the communists and the leftists realized that we keep calling ourselves communists. What's going to happen is that people are going to reject us like they did all through, through the time. So they cleaned themselves up, shaved up, cleaned up, tidied their hair, wore a nice suit and talked in an accent, which was a British accent, and turned themselves to be socialists. Uh, you make a very, very, very interesting and important point here. So what is communism, Marxism, whatever you want to call it? It is actually a socio-political tool toolkit that is designed to place a very small number of, of people in power at the expense of everybody else. And it is designed to keep mm -hmm. them in power. Now yep. you can so all you do is rebrand yourself. Don't call yourself communists. Don't call yourself Marxists. Call yourself liberals. Call yourself socialists. Call yourselves feminists, call yourself whatever you want to call yourselves, but use the same techniques and tools. And, and keep it up. <laughs> you, you. you look at Ursula von der Leyen, <laughs> all you need to do is she wears these nice bright clothes. I think she needs to be put into gray and black, right? And wear a black bag. And there you go. You've got there a you go. good. East German, you know, politician right there. <laughs> I, I mean, you yeah, know your world war history. I know you've spoken about East Germany and a lot about in your channel. And I've seen some other podcasts where you've spoken about it. So I know what you, I know when I say this, you understand what I'm saying. She is a form-fitted East German politician. Yeah. And you, you've had this influence in, in Europe, in, in the EU, even in NATO. Uh, NATO not so much, but definitely in the EU. So yeah, that's what, that's all it is. You just rebrand yourself. You give yourself a new title, new appellation or whatever. And then you continue with your agenda. And no yeah. one, no, no one, yeah. nobody's wiser. So um, thanks so much. He says, Abhijit says, some prediction experts say that Middle East Arabs are like Chandravarshi, like Gujaratis. Is this true? Are they coming back to their roots? Um, prediction goes into the future. We are talking about the past here, right? 
Um, uh, so look, I am not any kind of authority on the history of the Arab people. Uh, we know that uh, the Arabs used to be polytheistic people before uh, what happened. Yeah, yeah, po po pre pre fourteen hundred years ago, they used to be polytheists. Many of them used to be Jews. Uh, we know that uh, Yatrib or or uh, Mecca, right? It used to be uh, there used to be a big polytheistic temple there. Lots of goddesses. Uh, forget the names, Allah and so on and so forth. Three female goddesses used to be there, yeah. and so on. So we know there was polytheism. That is an undisputed fact that the uh, the uh, Muslims call it Jahiliya, which means the the days before Islam. That's what they call it. Now, where the Chandravanshi like Gujarat is, I have absolutely no clue because I have not studied their history. Uh, there was a moon goddess, obviously, but does yeah. it mean there were Chandravanshis? I'm not sure about that. So yeah, uh, sorry, I can't. They were idol I worshippers. They were idol the worshippers. Worship. There's no question. Yeah, Very there's much. no question. Very much. It. Yes. Now, because you know when you when you, so when you're saying Chandravansh, it refers to a blood lineage, right? A, a yeah, lineage. Yeah. So, so I'm not sure about that. Whether they they are related to us. I mean, some of them do look like us, but there is a darker origin to their looks like us, because as we know, we have we were under uh, we were under colonization by the Turks and other other. Uh, other such peoples for a long period of time and many of us, many of our female ancestors Ladies. were taken off as slaves yeah. and that's why many of the Arabs look like us. That's a different story. Yeah. Because there's also another flip side to this because if you look at when the Pangea broke up, you know, the only place that had any life was there all around. Uh, but the, the island of Bharat that time, when it was floating up towards the Eurasian continent, we flourished because there was no threats. There were hardly any dinosaurs in our area. And the oh, rest of the world did. There were dinosaurs. Very, we had, yeah, there were, but not the quantum that you had in kind of Europe, because that's why they were hunter gatherers. While at the same timeline, we guys were still establishing our, you know, a whole lot of things were getting established. So, 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 the, the, so the dinosaurs died 66 million years ago. Yeah. Humans, modern humans, e emerged 400,000 years ago, less than a million years ago. This is now, big, big, yeah. big, big gap. Yeah. And 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 uh, and the continent of Bharat hitting Eurasia, that happens about well about 40, 30, 40 million years ago. So there's mm. a huge gap in the timelines here. So I don't think that that, that is the cause and effect. That's thing. that's one of the ways a lot of people explain the factor that there is a difference between how this land has been kind of worked upon. Uh -huh. uh, and this is not recent ancient history. This is, you know, because somebody the other day I was watching, uh, not watching, I was reading an article where somebody dated uh, the history of Sanatan to about 17 lakh 60,000 years. Well, there were no humans at the time, so it doesn't work. I mean, as far I, as we I know, was, from I evidence. Bit from evidence. But, okay, this is something I need to kind of dig into because I have no clue. I'll have so, to so, really, uh, really dig into it. The way I see it, I, I go by what is the, the facts that we currently have, the best facts, yeah. the best evidence that we have. And as far as we know, the oldest evidence of, of uh, Homo sapiens goes back to 400,000 years, Char Lak Sal, which is Jebel Irhud, which is a cave in northern Africa. That's just mm. 4 lakh years ago. and there were Those were also primitive humans, not like us, but they were overall Homo sapiens as far as we can detect. So 17 lakhs or whatever, it just doesn't make sense. I was like, okay, I need to dig into <laughs> this because hmm. you never know. <laughs> you know, they're weird. Uh, you, never know, course, course. you never Always know. Always open to new information. Always. Yeah. Aditya, thank you so much for becoming a member. And uh, Soham, once again, thank you so much. Sir, yesterday's Munich Security Conference, Tony Blinken said, if you're not on the table, then you're on the menu. India perhaps is at all the tables. Why are we still on the menu? Oh, we are not the menu. Where are we the menu? Who's feasting on us? No one is. Oh. We're good. We have options. All those tables are various options we have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they got cheesed off with that question, huh? And his answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got quite cheesed off with that. You should have seen uh, the I hope you noticed uh, Anthony Blinken's face. He just turned around like that and he... <laughs> <laughs> right he in front that. of Blinken said that. <laughs> and they didn't have anything to say. If you look at it, 
both of them were just dumbstruck sitting there. They couldn't even respond back to what he said. Well, he had a perfectly logical answer. Where you can't, you yeah. can't respond to that. You can't. There's no come back to that. Yeah. Himanshu and Abhishek, uh, both of them ask a very interesting question. I'm going to combine both of them. Uh, Adi, sir, when do you es estimate India getting the permanent seat in the UNSE? And second one, Abhishek says, is UN getting yeah. irrelevant? Does India want the permanent seat? So I'll tell you what, the permanent seat in the UN Security Council indicates something. It indicates that you have a certain amount of power. Now, you don't need to be on that seat to have that much power. Power is a whole different story. Power is a combination of your size, of the of your geographical size, of the amount, the population that you have, your economic heft, your military might, and other factors. There's a whole amount of number of ingredients that go into the secret sauce that makes up that number, comprehensive national power. Okay, so once you have a certain amount of power, the UN Security Council seat becomes irrelevant. It becomes irrelevant, and once you reach that amount of power, you will the doors will automatically open for you. So you yeah. have to make it inevitable. You have to stop hankering after it. But of course. Our, our leaders and our foreign minister, etc., should keep on reminding the world that this needs to happen. That is fine. But we Indians should, should stop hankering after the status. We, we see it from the perspective of status. Or oh, we have not been given no. this status. Of star on the shoulder. I don't care. Correct. I don't care. Exactly. It's a star on the shoulder. We don't care. We have to reach that power, which means we have to grow our economy and grow our military might and other things as well. Power projection, so on and so forth. Fantastic. I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. And I think what we are doing with the G20 and next year, people are going to be surprised that we're going to get the entire South American region into the G20 along with the Caribbean and Bahamas Islands, that little mm -hmm. union of 13 little nations there, that all is going to join in into the G20 as unions. So when the European Union joined, right, that was the biggest thing. Aha. So multiple hmm. can join under a union, right? Okay, so the strength of the African Union got them in. And now I don't know if you know, Jay Shankarji is working with the South Af South American Union as well as uh, the, the, the Union of the Caribbean Nations, as it's called. CARICOM. So, inside. So when you calculate that, it's about 160 countries. <laughs> what they are they we doing there? <laughs> take off your UN. Khatam Ghani. <laughs> Suhas Reddy says, uh, trend suggests we are heading toward a decades-long recession in most of most of Europe, USA and China, like Japan's lost decades. Can Bharat still grow at a pace of 7% for more than 20 to 30 years? Look, I am not an expert in economics and in finance, so I may not be the right person to ask this question. I think that with the right leadership, despite me not being an economics expert, I think with the right kind of leadership, the kind of leadership we have right now, with the right kind of emphasis on, on manufacturing and uh, domestic consumption and growth and whatever else, I think we can do it. Okay, I may be wrong, but I am optimistic that we can do it 7-8% perhaps per year. I'm hopeful of 10%, where it may be aiming too high, of course, I, I have to be realistic. But I think we are the only nation in a position to actually pull this off. So yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic. You know, I don't hope for 10% ever. The yeah. reason is the higher you grow, the faster you grow up, the faster you come down. Yeah, we see so, that with China. We see that. Yeah. Aram se chalo yaar. Koi problem nahi hai. Hmm. Deedso ki speed mein nahi. Koi speed nahi. limit mein 70, 80 mein chalte hai. Aram se koi problem nahi hai. Pahunch jayenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, the deal with China is that the way it grew, its ambitions grew along with it. And became yes. over ambition. I don't think that we should ever be in that aspect because we're also human beings. We'll end up making the same mistakes. Well, it, it all depends on your on your on your values, your cultural moorings, and all that. The Chinese Communist Party That's... did not have any ideology, any any cultural moorings or any value mm. system that was grounded in ancient tradition. It was all about this newfound religion of Marxism, and that's mm. why they are the way they are. They have their own culture, which which now they are trying to reclaim because it gives them prestige that we are a three thousand year old civilization and so on. That's why they're trying to reclaim it. But the CCP, their, their, their values are very different. The, those are the leftist values or, or the land-grabbing expansionist values that we see. And, and when it comes to Bharat, we have our own civilizational values that we will always be in touch with. Uh, 
typically when we have a reasonable government in power like the one we have, that we are right now the previous one not so not so much but that one was a very weak government and bharat was mm-hmm. much weaker then so so i think that's the reason why the the nations in west asia like saudi arabia uae etc don't feel threatened by india's um, navy making its presence felt in that region they actually see it as something that's good for them which will give them more options as opposed to what they have right now there is only the shadow of one power over them right now that's actually it will give them that's options you know yeah that's true last couple abhishek another one abhishek says a uh, different abhishek i guess uh, is it a coincidence that all of uncle sam's enemies are old civilizational past it seems like the west has an issue with older cultures look the west uh, they 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 like to call themselves western civilization well i'm not sure they are a civilization they are more like an imperial system the west and look when it comes to enemies everyone's their enemy they would like to control the whole world take out the whole world turn the world into a monoculture or turn the turn the entire world into a single market that they can exploit that's what they would like and that's why they see everything as their enemy uh, we don't see we we never wanted any enmity with anybody so we are not their enemies even though they may be our enemy uh, it's not about having an issue with older cultures it's about having an issue with the whole world they see the world as a resource that is to be exploited and of course the us is one of the youngest nations in the world it's a nation that was created out of settler colonialism out of stolen territory out of the genocide of one culture of one one ethnicity and the slavery of another so yeah so it has a certain way of doing things and it's it 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 uh, sees everybody as adversaries and opponents to be to be defeated nice good answer i must say sir jis tarah se bharat uh, china bharat ko cordon kar raha hai क्या तो क्या हम भी रेडी हो रहे हैं क्योंकि चाइना हिमालय में कुछ नहीं कर सकता वो सी में हमसे ज्यादा पावरफुल है तो हमारी स्ट्रेटजी क्या है हाँ गुड क्वेश्चन देखिए जो चाइना चीन हिमालय में इतना ज्यादा कर नहीं सकता क्योंकि वहाँ का टेरेन बहुत ही इनहॉस्पिटेबल है वहाँ की एल्टीट्यूड इतनी हाई है कि आप वहाँ पे खड़े खड़े सांस नहीं ले सकते वहाँ पे कुंग तो कर ही नहीं सकते ये सिचुएशन है वहाँ पे हिमालय में एंड और दूसरा भारत का अनफेयर एडवांटेज ये है कि हमारे पास एक्सक्यूज मी हमारे पास परमाणु हथियार है जो उनके पास भी है बट दैट गिव्स अस द म्यूचुअली द म्यूचुअली अश्योर्ड डिस्ट्रक्शन एंगल दैट नोबडी वुड वांट टू क्रॉस सर्टेन लाइंस इफ अनलेस दे आर इनसेन तो फिर बात होती आती है सी पावर की नेवल पावर की तो चाइना हैज द वर्ल्ड्स लार्जेस्ट नेवी न्यूमेरिकली एक्सक्यूज मी Ah, excuse me. So, numbers ke hisab se, China has the world's largest navy, even larger than the US. And like Joseph Stalin said, quantity has a quality of its own. So then the question arises that China can then swamp the Indian Ocean region and overwhelm India and defeat India at sea, right? Question to yata hai. So why will that not happen? It's because China has enemies all over the place. They are worried about Japan, which is a formidably dangerous navy. They are worried about the enormous U.S. presence in South Korea. They are worried about the enormous U.S. presence in Taiwan. They are worried about the island chains. They need to keep a significant amount of the naval might, you know, in that area to ward off these problems and these threats which they which they perceive. So, if they want to fight with India, they can deploy maybe twenty percent of the navy if they are lucky. and when it comes to naval assets there is a there is a rule that no one knows if you have three naval assets only one will be operationally deployed at any point in time one will be being refitted at the, at the dockyard and one will be either coming towards deployment or going back from deployment yeah agar aapke paas teen aircraft carrier hai to kisi bhi samay par aapka ek hi aircraft carrier actively deployed hoga so if you have 3000 ships only 1000 ships can be deployed so if you look at all these limitations and if you look at the world from a realistic perspective you will see that china is far away from posing a genuine threat to india and the indian ocean region not it doesn't mean that we should take them lightly or be complacent we have to be extremely vigilant we have to be almost paranoid but yeah it's not like they're going to be able to swamp us overnight you know if if, if yeah. something like that is going to happen we'll be able to see it coming uh, some time away and the technology is also not pairing out to be what they kind of push it across as they've had major issues yeah. with their their ocean assets and stuff like that uh, yes indeed submarines and yeah submarines things have happened yeah know. submarines things have happened their aircraft carrier yeah. the last time they took it out 
towards the 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 sea of japan they had to tow it back yeah. and notice <laughs> one thing back. yeah notice one thing okay and i i uh, request all you audiences also you will see aircraft taking off the chinese aircraft carrier very rare probably one or two videos are they landing on the carrier and that's very curious to me why have you designed it so they just you take these things about you they take off and they have to land back at base what's yeah. the game here because the last time they did something and there was and i've spoken to uh, an admiral of the indian navy who you know who's who's very well versed with these kind of things he said there is a steel problem so when these aircraft actually go and hit the deck those decks are starting to crack Mm. they're not able to take the weight and the the ones that they've got is j15 j15 is a heavy aircraft big massive yeah. planes so huge thing so when they mm. come in they they're not able to actually take the steel and he says you know people don't agree to this but the indian steel of their of our aircraft carrier is at par with anything in the world i said okay that's interesting to know so i thought i'll just share <laughs> it Himanshu yeah. ji, thank you so much. He says, uh, "Do you think democracy is still going to continue after the century, or a new form of ideology coming up, especially for India around Sanatan Dharma?" Um, see, the way I see it, I don't care about which form of government is is in vogue right now or at any given point in time. I care about whether it is in line with the national interest and the civilizational interest. That's all I care about. So think back to the times when India was at its peak. when were the golden ages of india when we had the maurya empire when we had the kushan empire when we had the karkota empire the chola empire the maratha empire which form of government was in vogue then was it democracy no it was a dictatorship actually monarchy is dictatorship so how do we care about democracy dictatorship whatever what matters is the people are prosperous the nation prospers and you your your future is great that's what matters so i don't care if democracy is going to continue or not after a century i hope all no I ideology comes up. yeah that's it that's it that's all i care about i don't care about any ideology i hope no weird ideology comes up we have enough of those i i think uh, we would like to see our culture flourish that's all yeah second third fourth fifth sixth seventh eighth your opinion i absolutely agree i don't give a damn what you call us what what's the latest yeah. term wait, wait wait they they invented the latest term electoral autocracy wah <laughs> good job bol aa gaya kam se kam kuch to socha hai logon ne how can you have an autocracy by elections i mean what's wrong with you people yaar it's your language at least learn how to use it and the last one um, so home once again thank you so much abhi you, sir subscribe to your course from principles to at academy जन्म धन्या हो गया सर थैंक यू सो मच फॉर दी इमेंस एफर्ट सैल्यूट थैंक यू सो मच फॉर फॉर सब्सक्राइबिंग टू इट एंड आई होप इट हैज गिवन यू सम जेन्युइन वैल्यू व्हिच आई एम श्योर इट हैज सो थैंक यू सो मच अप्रिशिएट दैट फैंटास्टिक एंड द लास्ट वन सेज रोहित सेज आदि सर चावड़ा सर हाउ डू यू डील विद द डीप स्टेट व्हाट इज देयर अकिलीज हील वेल आई हैव बीन ट्राइंग टू लुक फॉर इट आई विल टेल यू व्हाट वी आउटलास्ट इट we have been around for 10000 years we stay on for another 10000 years we are simply links in a chain a very long chain so that's what we do the deep state is a new thing it it won't last that long we will last that's how you deal you, know, you just you just exist you stay you move on i think you said a very interesting thing 10000 years for an indian civilization is what a chai and coffee break yeah that's what look at our civilization where it goes Bharatiya, the, I mean, millennia and millennia. genuinely time immemorial, genuinely. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. Genuinely, genuinely. 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 Genuinely, gen
and all the best for your in person podcast some of them are coming out superb uh, i'm a big fan as well thank you so much and jai hind thank you so much thank you for having me jai hind